you know, with all the excitement over the last couple of weeks, I must be crazy to go after the NSA. Um, but I'm very excited to talk to you this morning. Um, I'm going to start with something a little bit different. Uh, last week, in fact, was the 30th anniversary of the movie War Games. Um, I don't know how many of you saw that movie, but it was a seminal movie in many ways. And in the movie, a very, very young-looking Matthew Broderick uh, plays a hacker. First time a hacker was displayed on, uh, depicted on screen. Um, and in the movie, he uses his microcomputer and dial-up modem to actually gain access to a NORAD supercomputer. Um, and he guessed correctly, actually, that the password uh, to get access to the supercomputer was actually the developer's uh, deceased son's name, and then sort of launches a series of events that almost results in global thermonuclear wars, the way they called it in the movie. Um, looking back on the movie, uh, it's an entertaining movie, but it was remarkably predictive in a whole lot of ways. If you uh, look around today, you'll see that uh, cyber war games, in fact, are a core part of many organizations' cyber readiness uh, efforts. In fact, we at Symantec run a large number of cyber war games. Uh, we run them internally. We run them on campuses with partners, with customers. Um, and the biggest one we run every year is one we run internally, where we open it up to all employees. Um, and you know, they can create teams of six, and they, we set objectives. Uh, last year, we had the teams fighting each other. This year, we actually set up a fictitious country called Siberia, C-Y-B-E-R-I-A. Yes, we are nerds. Um, <laughs> and the goal was the teams of six um, had to uh, basically capture the flag. They had to attack a lot of the critical infrastructure that we set up. Uh, so we set up an, a national oil company, a power grid. Um, and they collected points for the things they got along the way. What we didn't tell them was we partnered with uh, some uh, real world intelligence agencies uh, in the United States and outside, and we created hunting teams that the intelligence agencies ran trying to take out these teams. So great, uh, great event. We had lots of learnings. You know, our goal is uh, we want to unleash innovation. We want to unleash passion. We want to you know, do a lot of education. And one of the learnings I wanted to share here is, remember what I talked about in the movie, you know, Matthew Broderick had to guess the password to sort of break into NORAD. Well, when we were setting up the game this year for Siberia, we used real world infrastructure, right? So we used, for example, PCS controllers uh, that today are used actually in a large number of industrial systems uh, in our critical infrastructure. So in uh, water treatment plants, in the electrical grid, in factories, uh, and as we were setting up the game, we found that we couldn't use it as it was because it would be too easy to break into. Uh, and we discovered a large number of vulnerabilities. One of them, for example, was that uh, for this particular PCS unit, uh, the manufacturer actually hardwired in a password. Uh, and you know, yes, you could change it, but you could always reset it and it would go back to the hardwired password. And the password, it wasn't something complicated like somebody's son's name. It was, you know, it was an eight-character password, so pretty strong. Uh, not that strong, but, uh, and it was, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That was the password, and it was hardwired. Um, now, look, the people that make these things aren't dumb, but it it, it's reflective of a challenge we face, right, which is the people who wrote it, well, they wrote the code many, many generations ago, the initial unit was never intended to connect to the internet, and so when they wrote a lot of the core code, they didn't think about hardening it appropriately. They're not security developers. And then the code just got added to and added to, and somewhere along the generations, they added ethernet access. And then they opened it up to the outside world. And so when we think of our jobs as security professionals, a lot of what we're protecting was never designed to be protected. It wasn't built uh, with security in mind. And so as we think about the challenges that, uh, that our customers face and that we face as an industry, um, you know, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight password uh, is just one. When we talk to companies around the world, they'll tell us that they're facing uh, a lot of very big uh, challenges. The first one is that the surface area they have to protect, the information they have to protect, that amount of information is continuing to grow exponentially. So we at Symantec every year survey our customers, and one of the questions we ask them is, 
how much do you think the amount of information is going to grow in your environment over the next 12 months? And typically, the answer comes back in the 20 to 30% range. So pretty sharp exponential growth. But in the last couple of years, the numbers come back. And, and this year, I think we got 4,500 companies uh, and, and, and government institutions around the world to respond. And this year, the, the, the number came between 60 and 70%. And that's the same as we saw last year. So we're continuing to see this exponential growth in the amount of information uh, that exists within organizations that has to be protected. At the same time, we're seeing uh, the IT infrastructure in most organizations getting more diverse than it's ever been. You know, we went through a decade of standardization and consolidation. You can only use this PC and this laptop with this image. Uh, and that's completely changed today, right? You're seeing people bring their own devices, uh, plugging into the corporate network. Uh, you're seeing the first generation of wearable computing show up that's plugging into the corporate network. You're seeing the Internet of Things show up. I think there are 17 different ways, for example, to wirelessly communicate with today's generation of cars, right? Well, those cars are plugging into a network somewhere. And so you're seeing an incredibly heterogeneous IT environment that has to be protected. And at the same time, you're seeing the most sophisticated threat landscape that we've ever seen. Right? We were tracking uh, an incident once where uh, an individual uh, works for a small business actually had their smartphone compromised as they were going through security uh, at an airport in an Asian country. So they put their phone, went through the security, came out on the other side, there was malware on it. The attackers then use that phone, uh, get the, the, the corporate credentials off the individual's phone, got into their corporate network, which is a small business, but it did business with a large government agency here in the United States uh, that they then compromised through this individual's company. Uh, we're seeing the, the growth of what we're calling sort of multi-prong attacks, where increasingly today, uh, in one case, for example, a set of European regional banks were targeted by a bad actor, and the way they did their attack was, late on a Friday, they would hit a bank with a large denial of service attack. Um, and the idea was actually just to, to distract the security teams, because the security teams would then you know, quickly try to respond to prevent their network from going down and their website from going down. And while that was happening, they were actually launching another attack. And they used a phishing attack on a number of individuals, uh, and got into the network, and in the time that the security teams were dealing with the denial of service attack, they stole a whole set of ATM uh, card numbers and credit card numbers. So we're seeing multi-pronged attacks happen uh, that are part of increasingly sophisticated campaigns. So you have more information, heterogeneous IT environment, you know, more sophisticated attacks than ever, and at the same time, you're also seeing the rise in legislation, which uh, is intended to be helpful, but does produce another tax on IT departments. Uh, E-discovery uh, is a growing uh, part of what IT departments have to deal with today. Uh, a lot of you in the room have to deal with the Freedom of Information Act requests that come in. Uh, in addition, the recent directive uh, from the National Archives uh, Records Administration uh, talks about uh, what you need to do by 2019 in a lot of cases uh, to prepare to deal with e-discovery requests. Now, e-discovery is, is a very sophisticated uh, needle in a haystack problem, right? So in a lot of cases that we see, there'll be literally tens of millions of documents uh, that you deal with, but really only five matter, right? And so it's a, it's a sophisticated game of getting from, you know, the tens of millions to the five, and to do that uh, as quickly as possible, and to do that as cost-effectively as possible. So that's sort of the context we're dealing with. Um, we at Symantec have been working uh, in uh, partnership with the public sector in a whole lot of different ways, right? So uh, we just announced that our CEO, Steve Bennett, uh, is going to serve as part of the uh, National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee. Uh, we've been working with the House and Senate on the various uh, uh, items of legislation over the years uh, and uh, in thinking through it and thinking about the implementation of it. We worked with that White House on the February 12th uh, directive. Uh, we train uh, f judges and prosecutors uh, on how to deal with cyber-related cases through our Norton uh, Cybercrime Institute. Uh, so we have a deep partnership with the public and private sector. One of the things that we're sort of jointly thinking through, though, is also how we change the economic equation uh, in cyber attacks. Uh, there's a, a line from the movie that's interesting. 
you know, it's, it's a, this banter about the game itself, and uh, I think the computer is the one that says it's, it's an interesting game. Uh, the only way to win is to not play at all. And that's sort of a fundamental premise of a lot of games, right? Tic-tac-toe all the way to nuclear war, which is you got to set it up such that the only way you win this game is if you don't play at all. And one of the challenges we have in cybercrime is it's almost exactly the opposite, right? The reality is it's not that hard to do, and there are almost no consequences, right? So if you are a government actor that steals intellectual property from an organization in another country, there are no consequences today, right? And we need to think about that to say, look, today we've got to make it a game such that the only way to win is not to play. There have got to be economic consequences, potentially criminal consequences associated with stealing intellectual property. So we've been doing a, a, a lot of work with the public sector, but frankly, there's still a lot of work uh, to be done. From a technology perspective, as we think about how to address the challenges, I'd say there are three big themes we're focusing on uh, at Symantec. Uh, the first one is uh, making everything more intelligent. Right? So as we think about how to solve this problem, uh, you have a large amount of information across a whole set of repositories uh, that are being attacked by very skilled attackers. Um, and, and as we think about intelligence, we think about it at three levels. One is you've got to be really intelligent around what's going on in the environment. right? Uh, we have the world's largest um, non-military uh, uh, global intelligence network. We have probes in over 200 countries and territories. Uh, we deal with uh, 10 trillion logs per day, 20 million logs, security logs per minute. Uh, to back that up, we've created the world's largest big data analytics backend for security. Um, that allows us to deal with 1.7 trillion pieces of information, uh, to deliver verdicts on 100 million URLs, uh, and, use, uh, and, and have verdicts of 3 billion files. And we do that every six hours. So one is you've got to be really intelligent about what's going on in the threat environment. The big change there, though, is uh, moving from being intelligent about the individual piece of malware, so what's the, the piece, the phishing attack, the, the, the virus that was used, to being more uh, aware of What's the overall campaign that's being run, and who are the actors, right? And so in the example I talked about earlier, you, know, you could have seen the attack on the bank as a denial of service attack, or you could have seen it as a phishing email that came in, but really you needed to see it as it was this actor that had this campaign footprint that runs denial of service attacks at around 5 o'clock. You, know, you had to build up the whole campaign, and so intelligence really needs to move from being smart about malware to being smart about campaigns. In addition, though, to knowing what's going on outside, you have to be really smart about what's in your environment. Uh, with that much information, it's really not possible to protect all of it equally. Uh, and nor would you want to, because the cost of doing that would be astronomical. And the trick is to understand what's your most important, what are your most important information assets, and protect those more fully. Uh, so get a handle on, uh, it, are you worried about uh, source code, employee records, you know, military plans, blueprints, uh, and understand where that exists within your environment and what's happening to it as it moves within your environment and more importantly, in and out of your environment. Uh, so a lot of research going on uh, in our company around the field of uh, data loss prevention, uh, around classifying the information in your environment uh, to make sure you understand what is the, what's happening with that top 1%, that top 5% of information that's the most valuable in your environment. And the third new area of intelligence that we're focusing on is not just knowing what's outside, knowing what's in your environment, but knowing who you are as an organization. And what we mean by that is, uh, how do you operate? What's normal for your environment? So you can baseline what, you're, what should be happening within your environment, and then look for anomalies, right? If people are accessing records that they don't normally access, even though they legitimately have access to them. If they are downloading large amounts of information, again, that they might legitimately have access to, but don't do it usually. And so the third part of intelligence for us is this baselining of uh, an organization's behavior, uh, and then looking for anomalies uh, and using those to trigger investigations. So more intelligent. Uh, now, uh, we uh, also believe, though, as part of being intelligent and part of being efficient, it is really important to understand the information in your environment. I talked about that a little bit 
uh, from an intelligence perspective, it's also critical from an efficiency perspective. Because what we find is a lot of the information in your environment is either useless information, so newsletters, um, or duplicate information. Uh, we believe you can reduce by almost 90% the volume of data in your environment if you were able to deduplicate the data in your environment totally. Uh, and so we're spending a lot of our research dollars in trying to figure out how you can be smarter about all the information. Uh, delete the information that you don't need, uh, dedupe the information that you do need, so that you have as small a footprint as possible. It's still going to grow, but it'll allow you to tame that 60 to 70% growth you're seeing year on year. Um, and then cross everything, right? Uh, we don't believe the future is going to be you know, one where you can standardize on anything, to be honest. Uh, the, the technologies in your data center are going to change, whether they're in your data center or in a public cloud or a private cloud that you run, that's going to change to the standards that you adhere to. Uh, is it OpenStack? Is it Open Cloud? Is it AWS? That's going to change to the endpoint devices are going to change. And so, you know, we truly believe in a, you know, sort of no, uh, no hardware agenda approach, which says, look, certain things have to work across your infrastructure, your security policies, your e-discovery policies. You need to abstract that away from the infrastructure itself so that you can apply it confidently and embrace what comes along. And so those are the areas that we're doing a lot of research in. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I'll give you some stats. Uh, today, 94% uh, of breaches that happen in organizations end up being reported by a third party. So people don't even know that they're breached today. The average amount of time that uh, bad actors stay in an environment is 416 days before they are caught. And the amount of time it takes to respond today has grown 71% from a year ago. So we have a lot of work to do, and I truly believe that we're probably in the midst of the most profound change in security uh, that I have ever seen. I think that the industry has ever seen in the last few decades. That we need to rethink security. It's not a collection of point products from a number of point vendors. I talked to one, uh, uh, one IT, senior IT uh, security professional who said, look, I run uh, over 100 security products from 65 different security vendors. And he said, look, I, I don't like the cost of it, but mostly I don't feel secure. We need to rethink security. Security isn't a bunch of tools that you stitch together. And it's not a bunch of vendors that provide a bunch of tools. We truly believe that going forward, we'll be talking to you about uh, security as a service. So not 100 different point products that I make, but the service that we can offer that covers the bigger problem area. And we believe you will not be talking to 65 different security vendors, that you will end up picking a few that you get into deep partnership with. And we hope to earn our place in that world. Thank you very much.